days. A crop that predominantly defines Kenya's food security. Ugali, the Kenyan staple, is derived from maize flour. In last year's general election, the politics of the rising cost of maize flour took center stage, and the promise of lowering its cost is what might have catapulted President William Ruto to State House. Among the first orders of business for President William Ruto was lifting the 10-year-old ban on genetically modified crops and foods. A turnaround, he said, was occasioned by the drought the country was trapped in. A decision that got the country talking. Because there's so many things competing for death. There's nothing wrong with adding GMO to that list. A lot of people elected the government with a lot of hope. It's betrayal. A monumental decision like this one should have involved all people's representatives. It works exactly the way vaccination works. So we found a way to immunize plants so that they can defend themselves. It has been there for 40 years, but 25 years people are just eating it out there. If anybody in this country has ever been injected with insulin, that is GMO. If you took a vaccine on COVID-19, that is GMO. There has not been any direct you know, relationship between GM foods and uh, cancer. The whole of South Africa, 100% GMO. Umesikia mutu wamemea pembe uko South Africa kwa sababu walikula GMO. Three counties come to mind when you think about Kenya's food basket, Nandi, Wasingishu and Transoia counties. These are in Kenya's North Rift region. We are in Transoia County, Kenya's maize capital, and we are here to find out how the new directive on genetically modified crops and food will have an impact on farmers, not just here, but in other maize growing counties in the country. William Koros is busy getting orders for bags of maize ready. It is harvest time here in Endebes, and this means that large-scale farmers like Koros will be servicing orders for a grain that is now scarce and expensive for the little available. Kenya's maize production has been falling over the years, forcing the country to import the grain from neighboring countries in East and Southern Africa. The past 25 years have seen Koros increase the production of this 600-acre land a hundredfold. We visited him just over a month after the ban on genetically modified food and crops was lifted. He says he is open to exploring varieties that will increase his maize production. If you look traditionally, we used to produce average of 10 bucks per acre, 12 bucks an acre, 25 bucks an acre. We're doing 30. Now, like here on the farm, I'm getting about 50 to 54 bucks an acre. That is actually an improvement and more better money to the farmer. So I, th I feel we've actually worked without even being noticed. To Koros, the importation of GMO maize is only a temporary measure and the government should look into empowering local farmers to boost maize production. If you look at South Africa, if you look at uh, Europe, and maybe even India, or they're actually improving on their yields and resistance, it does not necessarily that GMO is something that is actually harmful to the human being. But I believe if we are able to adopt, we'll, not, we'll be producing instead of being the net importers. We'll save the country a lot of money. Even the subsidy itself is not even sufficient. However much fertilizer you're going to apply, if the yields are better, or take for example, we'll save a lot of money if we have a variety that is resistant to fall armyworm, which is actually causing havoc uh, to the farmer. As a former agriculture extension officer, Koros says there is a huge information gap between farmers and the government that develops and executes agriculture policy. He says this will determine how best to integrate GMO maize into the farming system. We don't have field assistance to pass the, disseminate the same information that used to exist in 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. I think in the sub-county we have only one agricultural uh, officer now, but we used to have about 40, 50 for the importation of the GMO maize. This is only a short gap measure, but that is not the ultimate solution. Because I'm very sure if farmers can adopt to, uh, to 
the new technologies, new varieties. Then, in a year or so, or two years, we'll actually sustain ourselves, and even maybe on second or third year, we'll be able to export to other neighboring countries. Kenya's oldest seed company, Kenya Seed, has a prominent presence here in Transoya County, where it contracts farmers to grow some of the maize seed varieties developed. On average, Transzoya County produces 4 million bags of maize annually. The leadership here is not pleased with a cabinet decision. A monumental decision like this one should have involved all people's representatives. Um, Kenya's cabinet doesn't represent anybody. They're not elected by anybody. Actually, the only person who is elected in that cabinet uh, is just the president and the deputy. Our voice was not heard before that, that ban was lifted. And that's why we feel seriously aggrieved, uh, some of us. Agriculture devolved as it is. There are still very many other policy decisions that are made by the national government, like now this one, which county government was consulted. The governor accuses the government of refusing to invest in the local farmer whose yields are dropping as the climate changes. Kenya relies heavily on maize imports to supplement the low production. And the government is willing to pay higher for the imported maize than the locally produced maize. So the question has been, been why? These good prices are offered to, to the importers of maize. Why can't it be given to the, to, to the farmer? We are arguing, and correctly so, that the inputs were very high, very costly. Why can't the government give the farmer more money? So people believe that there's somebody who is manipulating the market forces. It's not about supply and demand. Yeah? When, when the demand is very high, somebody wants to bring in a lot of maize to, 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 you know, to sort out that. So the price... Uh, is mechanically su suppressed. This maize milling plant in Wasingishu County was born out of frustration by a large-scale farmer's son, who often saw his father selling maize at a loss to brokers. Initially, the milling plant was getting all its maize from a single farmer, but now works with more than a hundred maize farmers in Uwasingishu and other North Rift counties. Due to inconsistent supply, Buffalo Millers is forced to supplement with maize imports. Because the harvest normally comes at the end of September to maybe March or April. From then we don't have supply of maize from Uwasingishu. That's when we look uh, to other places like importing maize from Tanzania, going to up to Uganda. Uh, even last year we went up to Zambia. This miller says the farmers have one major concern. They don't want a scenario whereby they are being controlled in terms of sourcing their seeds. You see, when you, when you, when you take GM maize, it means like you'll be getting your seed from only a certain person or a place. So the Farmers are very cautious about it. Agriculture continues to undergo metamorphosis in the quest to produce better yielding plants and animals to meet the present day food demands. In 1922, the world welcomed the first hybrid corn, which was commercialized immediately. In 1940, plant breeders discovered the use of radiation or chemicals to alter an organism's DNA. By 1973, biochemists Herbert Boyer and Stanley Cohen developed genetic engineering by inserting DNA from one bacteria into another. Nine years later, in 1982, the United States Food and Drug Administration approves the use of genetically engineered insulin to treat diabetes. The first genetically modified plant, antibiotic-resistant tobacco, was planted in 1983. By 2019, at least 190 million hectares of land in 29 countries were under GM crops. Today... The United States of America is the biggest producer of genetically modified crops with 71.5 million hectares under cultivation. In Africa, South Africa became the first country to allow the growing of genetically modified crops through the passing of the GMO Act in 1997, which allowed for the growing of genetically modified maize, soybean, 
cotton and canola and is the ninth largest producer of GM crops in the world. Other African countries that have since followed suit include Tanzania, Malawi, Uganda, Sudan, Egypt, Nigeria, Burkina Faso and Ivory Coast. In Kenya, the opening of this level 2 biosafety laboratory by the then Minister for Education, the late Professor George Saitoti in 2005, set the stage for the exploration of genetically modified crops in the country. What would follow in 2009 was the enactment of the Biosafety Act that would see the establishment of the National Biosafety Authority to guide the implementation of biotechnology policies, among them G. So for the last 17 years, we have been conducting research here at Kenyatta University in trying to improve germplasm, specifically maize, sorghum, uh, cassava, groundnut, tomato, many of these uh, germplasms that are critical for us as a country. We have been genetically modifying them against uh, constraints that are unique to us as Kenya. Currently, Kenyatta University is the only university with that kind of lab in East and Central Africa. There is a number of lab similar to ours in Kalro, in Il Rebecca, and the latest one now is in Isipe. So those are the only four labs in this country that are accredited by National Biosafety Authority to conduct research on GMO-related stuff. But this milestone was short-lived after the government in 2012 banned GMO in the country. This decision was informed by a study by French biologist Gilles-Éric Serralini, published in the Food and Chemical Toxicology Journal, which found that rats fed with GM maize developed tumors over time. The journal retracted the study a year later on grounds that the rats Seralini used in the study were prone to cancer regardless of what they were fed. The journal also said Seralini's study had not been peer-reviewed. Incidentally, we don't have a lot of clinical data uh, on the relationship between uh, GM, you know, genetically modified or genetically engineered foods and the risk of cancer. So most of the studies that have been done, actually animal studies, so we don't have a lot of human studies that, uh, that you know, have, have, have uh, assessed that arena. There's no proof, there's nothing to show in a scientific report. It's only heresy you find in the media. Not, not the total media. It's generated by anti genome groups. They generated to keep people in fear and scare so that we lose. And I believe it's, we are the people losing now. If you look at Africa, we are the most insecure continent. We are the continent that is importing. We are spending 35 billion US dollars importing food crops. So what is a genetically modified organism? Now in genetic engineering, the luck is that we have realized that anything that is alive that you see walking or scrolling or just bacteria, whatever it is, in their DNA or in their genome, they only have four letters, A, T, G, and C, that repeats itself in different sequence. So others have, like you and me, have 3.2 billion. Other forms of life have, say, even a million, others have two billion. So that is what gives a plant or a cow different from a sheep and everything else. But all that is in the genome. Actually, the letters are the same, only that the sequence varies. Genius information, you can actually move information that controls this from this to this. It works exactly the way vaccination works. So we found a way to immunize plants so that they can defend themselves by giving them the same information so the body builds as a system. Now that is what is now controversial because in nature, there is no way this information or genes will move from this bacteria to the maize. The National Human Genome Institute defines a genetically modified organism as a plant, animal, or microbe in which one or more changes have been made to the genome, typically using high-tech genetic engineering in an attempt to alter the characteristics of an organism. 
Biotechnology is the use of technology in biological systems, living organisms or parts of this to develop or create products. It is used majorly in medicine, food, industries, agriculture, the environment and marine. GMO falls into the agriculture bracket of biotechnology. There's no, I would say, health issue. There was no uh, an environmental issue. Yeah. It is just political. It was just political. Plant pathologist and virologist Dr. Florence Wambogo is one of the leading scientists in the country who is credited with pioneering tissue culture banana technology that is now in use in 17 counties and 11 African countries. Dr. Wambogo believes that the lifting of the ban will open up biotechnology research in the country. Lifting the ban will also open the university now, so, so our, our scientists, our young scientists get involved again. There's hope. We had already got uh, trials for maize, trials for cotton who has been released. So we have a ban, then how does that help us? We are there to revive our cotton industry. How can we revive our cotton industry without this technology? We need to invest in the communication. We need to take the word out there to, to, to reduce the fear, because there could be well genuine fear. We are bringing it up. Hapa, you can see here. Ye, ye pamba, come in a quarter like this. Unashika, unachua moja na mna ye, unachuna. In 2020, the government approved the commercialization of genetically modified cotton after successful trials. We have come to Busia County, where farmers are planting BT cotton as part of the government efforts to revive local cotton production and processing. I am guilty conscious. One such farmer is Barnabas Nyapara, a cotton farmer for five decades. And with me as a farmer, Practically on the ground, I have realized that BT is more productive than KSA81M. It has got more balls, it grows quickly. At the moment, after harvesting, you can see the farm there, and I'm still continuing picking. I've got already three tons in my store. Formerly, I used to get one or two tons. As one of the farmers who are working closely with the government in commercializing BT cotton, he wants the government to increase cotton prices in its revival plans. Neighboring countries of Uganda and Tanzania are said to be offering better prices for the crop. A Kenyan farmer should be induced to grow more cotton by giving price a good price. There has been a problem of pricing and marketing. People differ with the knowledge, understanding. But should you follow practically from the experts, their advice, I don't see the reason why I cannot succeed. That doubt can be out. Coming to Bosia was more for us to see how farmers are implementing biotechnology in agriculture. This is Mzenya Para's cotton farm, and for the last two years he's planted purely BT cotton. When you come here with a scientific or laboratory perception of how biotechnology looks like, the farmers will tell you there's not so much of a difference. However, the difference is in the yields, and the farmers here are getting much, much more returns compared with previous years. Cotton is not the only crop that scientists have been keen on employing biotechnology on. Ingawa sasa kuboresha kilimo sasa ni anaza sa kuboresha better the best. Cassava, a main crop in Busia County, is also undergoing modification to make it resistant to the brown streak disease. Busia is one of the leading producers of cassava. Ungepata hii shamba Iko na mchanganyiko ya varieties karibu kumi. Lakini kwa sasa, specifically, every paddock ama every portion na variety yake. Kima pato simbae ni mzuri. Kwa mbegu tapata pesa, pia kwa tubers. Ni kama kuhua eh, ndege mbili na jiwe moja. Mm. Eh, unatupa kwa mbegu iko pesa, tubers iko pesa. Farmers here are using mobile applications to detect if a plant has been infected by disease. That way, they are able to arrest a disease before it affects the entire crop. Najaribu kuangalia tuna simu kama ya app kama hii, to detect. Inapu kuambia, hii kuna 
brown stroke disease mm. uh, tunaitwa rogging kwa lugha ya ya kilimo mm. yani kuyondoa hakuna mm. haja zikae mingi na zilete magonjwa hakuna uh, maana mm. so far Genetically modified cotton is the only GM crop that has been released to farmers and researchers are hopeful that soon all other crops under research including maize will be available to farmers. And like this is the now the evidence that maize will easily get contaminated because these ones were pure uh, were pure purple. But anti-GMO campaigners say the opening up of GM seed production in the country will usurp the smallholder farmer's right to own seed. Even if we embrace GMO, it would be surrendering our food sovereignty to other people so that they are the only one who can give us seeds every time we need to grow food. You surrender all your rights to feed yourself to determine how to eat, to determine how to grow. GM food is, an, is opportunistic, it's not a solution because we got where we are in terms of food insecurity and people dying of hunger because of drought. This is a more of climate change related issue. Concerns from these quarters also believe that GM seeds will affect the country's biodiversity through cross-pollination that may have an impact on Kenya's horticultural exports to the European Union. In Europe, a lot of countries, almost all the countries, GM is illegal, GMO food is illegal. Mm. Therefore, uh, it will force a situation where we have a higher level of compliance than we used to have. And uh, even we might even lose those markets. Of course, BT cotton, when you look at it, you are saying it's fabric, so fabric you are not eating. But do you have control on the bees and, and butterflies that come for nectar from, the, from that, 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 that cotton? You don't have control. Do you know what will happen when, you, the, when the bee collects nectar from there, then you collect your pure honey, natural honey, and you take that honey? What will, it hap what will happen to your body? Everybody else all over there, people are running away from GMO. So while others are running away and embracing, and people will tell you, when, when you argue the way I'm arguing, they'll say you are primitive. You don't have to embrace technology. You know, they, you know they, they want to demonize you. Not everything that comes from out there is good. There is actually a UN moratorium not to use the terminator gene in development of GMO. Those seeds that we are calling indigenous, they have undergone several evolution and changes. That is why we are not the same people like our great-great-grandfathers. You know, genes change uh, the expression profiles depending on the environment. That is what we call in our field epigenetics. And therefore, whoever is holding on to their you know, kind of seeds and thinking that they are safe, they are not safe because the environment is changing. Climate is changing. Pests are getting more virulent. Diseases are getting harder. The soils are getting deprived. Floods are coming soon. This is what we are, the time that we are living in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to start speaking or to adopting technologies that speak to all these things. Recently, President William Ruto gave his reasons for lifting the GMO ban, saying it is necessary for Kenya to break the cycle of food insecurity and lower the cost of food. Mimi kama kiongozi wanchi, siwezi kuhatarisha maisha ya wananchi walionichagua mimi mwenyewe i am a scientist every scientist in kenya wanakubali ya kwamba gmo haina matatizo yoyote nia yangu ni kuhakikisha kwamba tuko na mpango ambayo itatusaidia kuhakikisha kwamba tunaondoa kabisa changamoto ya gharama ya maisha Kupanda, ikafika mahali wa Kenya wengine batu wa But the chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture says the importation of GM maize slated for some time this year is strictly for animal feed, whose prices have been rising due to humans and animals depending on the same batch of maize reserves. Previous committee was involved and we, we consulted the executive to think about allowing the livestock feed manufacturers to import BT maize to reconstitute animal feed so that we stop competing with the cows for the same maize. 
Then you reduce the cost of the maize. In a packet of maize doesn't have to be 210, 250 shillings. It can be 180, 120. The Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture is the gatekeeper on agriculture policy in the country. And Dr. Mutunga says for Kenya to move from being a net importer of food to an exporter, the country needs to revise its land use policies. There is migration into the high potential areas and overutilization of those areas with otherwise activities. What countries have done is they have come up with clear land use policies and laws. If an area is designated as agricultural potential area, it is not used for urban development and is not used for uh, residential. We have a lot of fallow land lying everywhere. Go to our research stations, they have so much land, so many thousands of acres lying fallow. Some rich individuals in this country have got a lot of land. There was a law that was put in place, I don't think it saw the light of day, to tax idle land. Ile chakula yote tumekuwa tukiagiza miaka hii yote. Tayari iko na GMO. Chakula yote tumekuwa tukiagiza. Kwa ile kebs wanasema it must be less than 1%. So na hiyo less than 1% tunalipa 30 40% more. Kwa ile kwa hiyo eh, chakula ambayo eh, iko 1% GMO. Sasa mimi tukajiuliza kama ni 1% ama 2% ama 3% ama whatever. Si percent tu ni percent sasa chakula yenyewe ni GMO tayari. Sasa hii kusumbuana na, na percentage ndio ulipe gharama nyingi. Hiyo ni kukosa mpango. Where that means is coming from? Do Kenyans go? Yes. When Kenyans go there, do they eat it? Yes. Have they grown on? Have they died? So this is all, it is all jumbled up into, you know, there's so much perception. We are suffering unnecessary perceptions. We do not have any basis in science. But in a research setting, then you may be able to demonstrate that the National Cancer Institute says it will be collaborating with the National Biosafety Authority to study if there is a link between the use of herbicides on GM products and cancer. There is actually evidence showing that this glyphosate component within herbicides uh, has some health effects, including issues of gastrointestinal uh, disorders, certain cancers like cancers of the thyroid, cancers of the liver, some blood-related cancers like a myeloid, leukemia. We need really to uh, generate longitudinal data on the likelihood of, of, of such exposure you know, leading to cancer. There is consensus that the government needs to do much more to create public awareness on genetically modified crops and food. There are also calls for GM food to be labeled as such to allow consumers to choose what to consume. Bridget's Ghana, NTV.